if you don't talk about the elephant in the room, you have nothing to talk about. Right. It's like, what, right. what's your, uh, the album is good. Uh, <laughs> there are songs. We like them. <laughs> uh, this song is about hope. This song is about love. Hey, what's going on? I'm getting ready to take my kid trick-or-treating, hence the skeleton onesie. Had to take a minute, though, to tell you about this week's episode with Doc Coyle. You probably know him as the guitar player from the chart-topping active rock band Bad Wolves. You might know him from the band God Forbid. Maybe you saw him playing guitar in Ice Nine Kills or Lamb of God when they were touring with Metallica. Maybe you know him from the X-Man podcast he has. Either way, if you listen to heavier rock music you definitely know who doc coyle is and that's probably why you click the play button we of course dive into the drama a little bit you heard in the opening clip from doc we're going to talk about the elephant in the room uh if you're unfamiliar bad Wolves parted with their singer tommy vexed a couple years ago after tommy expressed some political views that ruffled some feathers and they end up doing a split and it really divided fans a lot of fans chose sides some chose the bad wolf side some fans chose the tommy vex side so that's just a little bit of context for what we talked about in this episode hope you dig it so doc thanks for hanging out with me today man so good to you know actually chat and kind of person in real life <laughs> i know i really just dis like discovered your your whole show and social media i'm like this guy's cool and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, thanks, man. do you want to be on the show i'm like absolutely be amazing yeah, yeah i've been following you for a little bit is i i just i love everything you're doing content creation wise and obviously band wise um but before we get into all that you know i want to start things off with a tough question you know something to divide fans right off the bat really nice. really rile the people up okay <laughs> Is The Nightmare Before Christmas a Halloween movie, or is it a Christmas movie? Ooh. I feel like it reads more Halloween, right? I think I got to go with that, too. Yeah, if I had to, if I had to choose. I think I got to go Halloween. <laughs> I mean, Santa's in it, but it's pretty spooky. Yeah, I mean, but you know what? Um, I like the fact that you can do it at both times of the year, all right? I like multifaceted media. Yeah. I like versatile properties, okay? Mm -hmm. I like things that interweave between genres and cultures. So, you know, I'm of the mind, uh, the more the merrier. So Yeah. Yeah, that's good for uh, Tim Burton, man. He gets to cash in twice a year on that <laughs> on that movie. There needs to be more Thanksgiving movies. You know, that's the problem. You know, Thanksgiving is an underrated holiday. Yeah, but more here's the problem. Thanksgiving, it's an only an American holiday. So oh, it doesn't really fair. travel. That's you know? true. And so we're a sense. little little america centric i think yeah. in, our, in our in 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 our minds but uh and you know it's like thanksgiving it doesn't really have it's not there's no religion attached mm -hmm. to it or this other thing so it's really about do you like eating You're right drinking and watching football and that's like you know well and that's the big problem too is like there's not enough ways to monetize thanksgiving whereas you know there's there's christmas there's obviously gifts and halloween there's like more like decorations and candy and stuff but yeah i mean they once they figure out a way to monetize thanksgiving more i think it'll do a global you know they'll kind of whitewash the, the history and they'll just be like no it's just thanksgiving man everyone just enjoy it like <laughs> yeah it's just food i mean think about it every day you have to eat anyway right right yeah we're just eating a little more yeah just a little bit <laughs> just going real carb centric you know yeah, it's yeah. very you know that's what i like about it i like the the carbohydrate level all right yeah, it's like yeah. we're doing the mashed potatoes and the stuffing right and the bread and stuffing is just a different kind of bread just diff you know? yeah different bread <laughs> i love it i love it like we're gonna take your bird we're gonna put bread in your bird because there's not enough bird there's not enough bread around it you gotta put it inside the bird too <laughs> Exactly, exactly. But I think this is, I think you're on it and uh, mm. I think you're you have the business acumen and the foresight to make this uh You think I could take Thanksgiving global? I could do this? Well I can think we... <laughs> you're this is what's populating your brain, your mind, and your spirit yeah. right now. So I that's think that's true. You know, that's it's true. the passion that's gonna lead lead, <laughs> lead the product, you know. Uh man, speaking of food, dude, you're on the road all the time. Like how do you do you do anything special to try to stay healthy while you're out there, try to like watch what you're consuming or you say fuck it and just enjoy it? You know, I, I feel like I go through these, um, you know, it goes up and down, right? So I'll, I'll be on the road and it really depends on the tour, right? So if you're on a, mm -hmm. a pretty big tour where there's catering every day and it's pretty consistent as far as yeah. you have healthy options, 
that's like the easiest to be healthy with. But keep in mind, those tours, usually it's like, oh, yeah, they have all these options. But then they'll have like seven kinds of cake. Oh, yeah. And pie. Yeah. And so there's a lot of temptation. So you have to be really disciplined with what you're consuming. Um, so I, I feel like I, I go through these, you know, time periods where I'm like really on top of it. Mm -hmm. And then I'll fall off and, you know, and then I'll feel bad. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough, man. I think consistency yeah. is the hardest thing. Um, and just, uh, you know, I think the hardest thing about being on the road is making it as normal as possible. You know, right, like, yeah. I think a lot of that is like eating at the same times, making sure you stop eating at a certain time, not, you know, drinking is the worst. Cause then if you're drinking, that's obviously bad for you, but then mm -hmm. You're hung over the next day, so you want to get eat crappy the next day. Yeah. You know, so it's like it has this like multiplier of effect. So I think you know if you're not someone who imbibes, mm -hmm. you're probably going to be in a better position. So it's something, especially as you get older. I think it's something I'm just like struggling with. I'm always fighting like that, that ten fifteen pounds. Damn you! <laughs> right, you know, getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a big party or? And then I, I work out too. Like I, I do. The main thing I do is yoga, actually. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Because I bring, I do this uh, DDPY, the Diamond Dallas Page yoga, and I bring Hell a, yeah, a yoga dude. mat, and it's like the thing that's cool is you can kind of just do it anywhere. You don't have yeah. to go to a gym. You don't have to like, oh, if it's cold outside, I don't want to go running outside. So it's it's something you can kind of do in any size venue. Mm -hmm. A yoga mat, small, you can kind of fit it anywhere. Um, so that's the main thing I do, and I because I have a lot of back and neck issues. Mm -hmm. So that stuff really st helps stabilize my, my back and, uh, you know, being on the road, just playing every day, it takes its toll on your body. Yeah. So it's really important. And it's a total b body workout. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yoga is no joke, man. That that challenges your body in ways that like, you don't even realize. Like when you go from like, if you're like lifting weights or doing cardio, and then you try like, you know, contort your body and all these like you know, formations and stuff. Yeah, that's that's a whole new kind of challenge for sure. Are you, uh, are you a big fan of wrestling or just a big fan of DDP yoga? I mean, when I was a kid, like, I was, you know, this was WWF. I don't know, yeah. I don't know no oh, yeah. WWE. I don't nah. know what that is. <laughs> That's like, it's like Twitter. Like, I'm still going to call Twitter Twitter. Right. <laughs> I'm going to call it X. It's WWF to me. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> so attitude when era, I was man, a for sure. When I was a kid, you know, like, the Hulk Hogan era, you know, mm. Ultimate Warrior, all that stuff, you know, it was my favorite thing in the world. I would, like, I was a nerd. Like, I would go to, like, Blockbuster, and then you could rent, like, the old... WrestleManias, so yeah. I would, like, watch the old stuff. I used to do and, that. Uh, yeah, I had the toys. You know, I was really into it. I would get you know every you know quarter. I would get you know that my dad would get the, the Royal Rumble or mm -hmm. SummerSlam, and uh, and then somewhere around like twelve, thirteen, I, I just kind of like you know I think you start getting into like more adult things. You're like guitar and. Those girls look pretty. Over I was gonna say you discovered girls. I think that was because that was a big turning point for me. I was like, uh, I don't think I should be playing with these action figures anymore. <laughs> like this, like it's this, like this is... I, I'm really enjoying these men in their underwear. Yeah, those yeah. Women in their underwear are really starting to uh, yeah look, look cool. Dude, has Bad Wolves had any songs in WWE? I feel like your music really lends yourself to that that whole genre because I mean that's that's Tommy definitely a kind did. of style. When Tommy was in the band, he had a song. Mm. Like he, just, but it wasn't the band. It was just him yeah. on uh, someone's song. I forget oh, okay. it was Baron Corbin or something like that. But I couldn't nice. be wrong. Yeah, but yeah, yeah we're open to it. You guys, let us know, dude. Right. Yeah, put this out here in the universe right now. We need Bad Wolves in the WWE. Forget the crap. Uh, I mean, never mind that we just chick tossed the new WWE. But <laughs> we we need we need Bad Wolves in WWE. I, it's, it makes sense, man. Like genre rise, it just fits perfect. Seth it Rollins is a big God forbid fan. Is he? Nice. My old band. Yeah, yeah. So he like uh he he did a post on Twitter like years ago talking about us and Shadows Fall oh, and like sick. kind of the bands from 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 that era. That was that was really cool. Yeah, a lot of those guys really love metal and like like hardcore and stuff. Um there's this one dude, I don't know his name, but he comes out to a kill switch engage song. I think he comes out to like Mike yeah, Curse or well, something. This Fire Burns I think was uh, Oh yeah, yeah. Was used for that. So maybe yeah. I forget the like I said, I'm so out of touch. With, like you know unless it's like a really big wrestler or someone who's mm -hmm. like you know crosses into our world like a chris jericho or something like yeah that. um but it's still great i mean i remember my uh my lady is really into wrestling and we, we went to an event a few years ago and it was like man this is fun why don't we why don't we do this oh, more yeah. often <laughs> Damn. it's so good man yeah 
If you could, uh, if you could be a tag team partner with any wrestler in history, who do you think it would be? Oh, Roddy Piper, man, easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the coolest dude ever, <laughs> man. Because he, because I got the feel of Roddy Piper, like he wasn't doing a character. I'm like, that's no, yeah, him. that dude, he's unhinged. Like that was just really him. <laughs> you know, no, but he's like, he's the ultimate bar fight. Yeah, guy, like, like that's who you want that has your back. You know, he'll just throw someone through a window. Uh, plus, yeah. he's also in They They Live, which I don't know if you see my tattoo. Can't oh, see nice. My, it's hard to see my They Live tattoo, but anyway, I'm a big They Live fan, so. Mm. Yeah, did you ever see Roddy Piper in the uh, that episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Yes, I have. I've seen every episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Dude, I was watching, uh, I, yeah, same, I love that show. And I remember the, the cast members were talking, because you know how unhinged Roddy Piper is in that episode. And they were like, oh, no, that was just him, like. He wasn't acting in that episode. Like he's really that guy. <laughs> I feel like I would have paid money just to see like Roddy Piper and uh, Gary Busey in the same oh my God. together, <laughs> just in a psycho off. <laughs> yeah, dude, you saw that buttered sausage clip, right? That's going around. What is it? With Gary, what is it? With Gary Busey, and he's like uh, talking about buttered sausage in like a podcast. <laughs> oh, dude, I'll just send you the clip. I, I, I've man. seen some clips lately where it's like. This guy is a uh, one yeah. of one. He's he's an interesting cat. <laughs> well, dude, I appreciate you making the time to talk to me because I know you got a ton of projects going on. Obviously, working on the new Bad Wolves record is about to come out soon. You just got done not too long ago doing the, a tour with a little this little rock band Metallica. You know, uh, I'm sure that was probably 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 a cool experience. I guess. I mean, what what's it like playing in a stadium? Like, is it difficult to kind of connect with the audience when you're at that? you know disconnect i imagine if we were doing it in a traditional fashion where you just play at the back of the mm -hmm. venue and there's just like a sea of people it might have been tough to connect to the audience but this you're they're right there man yeah they're they're you know you have the snake pit they're you know two inches from your face and then the actual barricade is i don't know 10 feet from you yeah yeah you know i mean you're you're right there and so you can you can see everyone's face and it's and you don't ever feel like you're playing to that many people because you just see who's in front of you. Focus. And you're not really, yeah. you know, you're not visually aware of everything. And so th this is the second time I've toured with Metallica. I did the '09 run when I was filling in for Lamb of God, and mm -hmm. that was also in the round. And that was the same vibe. Like I had never done those big, big wig arenas at that until that tour. You know, you're playing in front of seventeen, eighteen thousand people, and it's really. I was really nervous before I, I did that, but then when you get out there, you're just kind of, you know, right in front of you, there's, you know, maybe a few hundred, you know, maybe a few thousand people, so you don't really feel yeah. like you have, like, this whole thing, and sometimes, I, I'll be honest, I've been doing this so long, once you start doing these arenas and big festivals, it just starts to look like people, like, yeah. in some ways, it's, like, less nerve-wracking to play in front of thousands and thousands of people because it's it's you're almost just like you almost might, might as well be playing by yourself like it's mm -hmm. so big it almost doesn't matter whereas if you were playing some coffee house in front of 20 people and everyone's yeah. like looking at you and staring at you that's almost way more nerve-wracking i think oh i can imagine yeah like acoustic like just in front of like 30 that's people right. with their lattes when yeah you fuck up they're just like damn Doc. yeah they all know your your first name you know <laughs> speaking of is doc your real is that real your name Doc? Like straight no, up. No, my real name's Marlon. Oh, okay. All right. I mean, I, I don't want to bust your cover or anything, but no, there's no, there's no cover. Okay. It's just you know, you got your government name. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. You know, you got the name they called you in elementary school. The teacher, yeah. Marlon. All right, your homework's <laughs> late. Yeah. Then you got your 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 nickname, and I didn't give myself my nickname. My family gave me the nickname. Okay. Um, doesn't really mean anything, but yeah. it just stuck. And so you just, you know, you go with what people were they, call you. Were they hoping you're going to have, like, a career in, like, the medical field or something if they gave you that nickname? If they call him Doc, maybe he'll, like, <laughs> learn no, something. No, my lot. brother just started calling me that yeah. when we were babies. Nice. So I, have, I was not there when I got the name. So just, I just grew up. Oh, okay, right. That's what they <laughs> called me, so. Uh, man, I went off the rails there on that one. Um, so back to Metallica. What, what was it like the first time you met Metallica? Uh, it was a bug out, man. I remember... I was the first so the first show I did was 2009 in Nashville at Bridgestone Arena and I, it was the most nervous I'd ever been in my entire life right I played yeah. with Lamb of God like one of the be best bands 
really hard songs. I'm just like, I, I suck. I should probably go home. Like they should probably get a, a good guitar player. I don't know why they call me, but I'm just, you know, just nerd. <laughs> the just imposter syndrome started taking over. Absolutely. And, yeah. um, and I remember I, I saw, I ran into Kirk at lunch. It was like, uh, they had like a, a sushi chef, you know? And so I mm. ran to Kirk and I, 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 I don't know if I said something. I just, I don't, I don't even really remember, but, uh, I think it's cool thing about Metallica is like they'll always come like to your dressing room and like say oh, yeah. hi nice. and like visit with you and um, they uh, I remember that day uh, James came in the dressing room and Lamb of God had already toured with Metallica before so they knew each other so he just came in and you know and and you people don't realize about James Heffler he's like six four oh like, yeah he's a, he's a big dude he yeah he's tall but he's like tall but he has like some of the best posture you've ever seen you know what i'm saying he's just like yeah. and, and like like and he's like you know in good shape now he's in like amazing shape like it's crazy he's like 60 he looks he's in much better shape than i am i'll tell you that um but he just he just commands respect yeah you know you feel like general hetfield has come in and you're yes sir and he's like you just want to give him 20 push-ups just for yeah. for showing up in the dressing room uh but uh obviously so he has like there's an in intimidation factor, I think, with, with James, where you're like, you know, you feel like you're in, in dad's, like, office. You yeah. know, don't, <laughs> don't touch anything. Don't speak out of turn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, so I remember that, like, really, really definitely, but always super nice. All, yeah. like, they're just, like, the nicest band. They go out of their way to, to, uh, to, to be cool. And then they did this dinner in Montreal where they just brought all the bands. So it was Lamb of God, Gojira and metallica just the bands at like this dinner started at like midnight and went to like four or five in the morning and oh, that's when shit. they were still like you know some of the guys were sipping a little bit yeah. you know smoking a little bit it was a oh. it was a good night yeah. <laughs> and you just hung out but i i the table i was at was kirk and rob and like you know we got to like have a rapport yeah and now and then fast forward 10 years later i'm in a band with the guys yeah you know, it's wild that's so yeah i mean because initially as a guitar player especially you had to have been like hey so on seek and destroy like in your head you want to be like uh on kill them all did you like but you obviously didn't want to come off like a like a noob or anything like that was that kind of hard to control that part of you no because you know what it is, it is i think it's um empathy of the profession right because yeah. i'm also a performer and a writer and you know how you want to be treated mm -hmm. um you know it's like anytime i'm out out and about you know no one wants to be interviewed you know, right. um, it's, it's one thing if it's like just inquisitive, like just nerd talk, right? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. we're musicians. We like talking about, Oh, what, what kind of a uh, guitar is used on this? What kind of technique or yeah, yeah. whatever? Like just as long as it's natural, just mm -hmm. natural conversation. Um, but I think the, like I said, the empathy of the profession, meaning going like, you don't want to be like treated like you're not a human entity right that you're just right? a product like, or something or put on a pedestal mm -hmm. or anything like no i don't think that really feels good for 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 anyone so i think it's just always remembering just the fundamental common humanity like everyone's mm -hmm. people everyone has insecurities everyone uh you know you know they just i think they're so big and they're so like that that can be like alienating and isolating mm -hmm. and i think they they just want to be one of the boys oh yeah you know? i mean they are larger so, than life for sure yeah but it can i'm saying but fame and money can mm -hmm. you know make you disconnected from normal life you know and so yeah. you just treat people like people and and at mm -hmm. the end of the day we're all musicians and we've all dedicated our lives to this and you have that in common and that's gonna put you you know you feel like you're in your own little club and obviously yeah. like they're all our favorite band they're the ones we look up to um, and so you have that, uh, that, that gratitude just to be in the orbit of that. Like, and people go, Oh, all your dreams are coming true. Like, I never dreamed that. that was there. <laughs> I never thought that was on the menu. Yeah. It just, yeah. You know, it's beyond anything you could really, really imagine. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's, it's just wild. So the fact that it, that it happened then, then I, I started jam with Rob and then end up in the band with Kirk and then touring with them again, not in arenas, but now stadiums. Um, Crazy. You know, and and it's those shows. Keep in mind, they do like two shows per city, mm -hmm. once a week. There's only you know, what like uh, 
maybe 10 cities a year in America. Like those are like yeah. historical moments, right? Like oh, 80,000 yeah. people going to those shows that people are going to, you're going to remember that for the rest of your life, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's how they were able to, uh, outsell Taylor Swift <laughs> at SoFi. Yeah. Well, the, the one day record, I think Taylor Swift did like yeah. eight. Days. Well, yeah, she did like eight <laughs> nights of it. Yeah. But still the one day, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I did a no, news it's... story about that on my socials, and people were like, whoa, she, she sold out for eight. I'm like, I know, but it's the one-day record. <laughs> Still goes uh, Metallica. Hey, shout um, out. Actually, they did the same thing in Montreal when we did oh, really? uh, the Bell Center. Yes. Nice. Sick. Well, speaking of tours and uh, intimidation, uh, you're going to be heading out with Bush in a few weeks. So like, are you intimidated to be touring with one of the most gorgeous men in alternative rock history? Like, I'm, I swear, like... <laughs> he's 57 years old and he's still got like a chokehold on any millennial girl, you know, on her heartstrings. Did you see his, their new video? Where no, he's like, no. Goes the anti-aging thing. It's oh, really, no. it's, it's really cool. Actually. Oh, so I'll uh, check should, that should, out. Check out their new video. Um, so we actually, Bad Wolves played with them on a radio show in 2019. And I, yeah. and sometimes you ever, you ever this thing where you just, you run into a famous person like mm -hmm. unexpectedly, like you turn a oh, corner yeah. and all of a sudden it's yeah. like, oh shit. It's like, that's what happened. I was at, I was at catering and then you're like, and it's almost weird. You almost get like scared. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, oh shit. It's Michael Jordan. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, but so I like, I was like, oh damn, Gavin, Gavin Rossdale. Cause you know, he's yeah. in many ways, right? Like he's a celebrity almost outside of rock music you know he's oh, like yeah. an icon to, to some degree mm -hmm. uh 90s icon but you know they've still been a consistent band and still made records and still toured and uh and i got to watch that show and they were great you know they sounded awesome um and then their guitar player i did a podcast with him during the pandemic and he was really awesome so i feel like just not like connected to them but i feel like it's mm -hmm. not like this distant thing like i haven't heard about bush in 20 years and now we're doing this tour i feel like they're uh pretty contemporary yeah and uh and it's just like it's just something cool it's something you you know you announce a tour like that and people who don't usually like reach out to you like old friends like yo man you go, you're on tour bush man that's crazy right. like <laughs> you know yeah, it's, can i get gavin ross he'll spit on me man come on <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but again same thing i don't I don't put anyone on a pedestal. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone wants to be treated any different. Um, you know, again, he is a celebrity kind of outside of the the normal rock right. terms, where it's like you know that guy probably had like uh, you know paparazzi following him around and stuff. You mm -hmm. know, it's a different kind of um, life experience. So you know, I just want to treat people like people. I'm I'm just super super grateful that we got that tour, and I'm just like looking forward to it. It's just going to be fun, yeah. right? Just to be at those shows. Uh, hopefully get to meet the band and and connect on that level that's like probably the most important thing to me about touring is the relationships uh that mm -hmm. you make and those and those bonding experiences and it's a short tour so we don't really have a ton of time to uh to really connect with those guys but who knows maybe uh maybe they'll do a part two they'll bring the wolves back we'll see but no i'm, I'm really really looking forward to it and uh because I've I've enjoyed some a lot of their 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 newer music as well and oh yeah but they're doing it around uh one a greatest hits record so I imagine they're gonna be playing all the all the bangers on that tour oh man <laughs> yeah I saw them at uh, incarceration and uh, yeah I remember when they played come down and uh just a fun, yeah glycerine all the hits and like it because like they you know at those festivals they have like twenty five minute thirty minute sets so they yeah they just played all the hits and it was just like amazing to watch like the the audience just like completely melt back to the 90s <laughs> like it's just like woodstock all over again dude i didn't i didn't like i was watching like one of those woodstock documentaries i don't like they headlined one of the mm. days at woodstock that's how big yeah. they were that's so crazy man yeah gavin rosdale took his shirt off and calmed everyone down everyone stopped lighting things on fire for a minute and, <laughs> and then as soon as he left they went back to the chaos again <laughs> he did his best yeah, he did all he could, you know. Yeah, you mentioned the uh, the podcast, the X Men. If anyone's uh, you know listening and wants to listen to that after this, you know, make sure to finish this one first and go check out Doc's uh, podcast. But uh, dude, I love that. Uh, I love that you have so many things going on. You just, obviously, you must be a bit like me in the fact that you, uh, if you're not busy, you probably go a little stir crazy. You feel like you got constantly doing something. Is it uh, tough to kind of switch back to more of the 
content creation side of things because then you know it comes to editing and making social media posts and promoting like do you find that like a little more of a more, more taxing than getting to play guitar on stage in front of millions of people oh absolutely it's it's a weird thing where i feel like well a lot of it is geared around the bad wolves album because it's mm -hmm. like we we were supposed to go out with ask alexander and the who end up canceling the tour and you know a tour is such a great promotional vehicle for, for yeah. any band so without the tour it was like okay what can we do from home to like get some buzz going or connect with the fans or so yeah. i was just went right into that mode i i think i took maybe four or five days off because I, I did five months straight with about another month of rehearsing it was just crazy right and that kind of yeah. like melts your brain <laughs> to some yeah, degree uh but it was cool because I because I'd done the Ice Nine Kills tour, you know all their I you know I gained a lot of new fans on like social media and like I had a lot I had really good engagement you know people were really checking out what I was doing so I was like all right let me capitalize on that mm -hmm. and just keep it rolling and you know just here's you know podcast stuff here's guitar stuff here's me keeping it real stuff you know just mm -hmm. anything to kind of like create a story and and make something compelling yeah to whatever, you know whatever best way i could do it you know i don't it's weird you know i think in the scene right now you have these superstars you know you have right. the ronnie radkeys and the alex terribles that you know millions of people follow these guys like they're you know i'm a little peon you know compared to to like the real true superstars of, of this genre but uh but you still have to do your part to mm -hmm. like to connect with ever who is kind of seeing what, what what you're doing so it's weird like i go through these periods like all right i'm doing this and i'm doing this and yeah the editing and the bouncing and i'm doing you know and you're you have to upload and the caption yeah. and the, oh, you know God. and then yeah. you know damn i barely get to actually be creative with music like i actually mm -hmm. was thinking about it like because you know there's a chance i might you know maybe work on some solo material or people are asking about maybe do new God forbid stuff. And I'm like, man, if I actually want to get back to writing, I, I wonder if I have to just like completely take a break from social media or take a break from the podcast because it's just so time consuming to constantly be like, it is boom, 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 boom that you almost get away from the actual art of it. When you, all it is, is marketing, you know, mm -hmm. or, co you know, content. It's like a never ending thing. And then it's also pressure, right? Every day it's an email or a text from the label or management. All right, you guys need to do this and you record this video or do this. Po and it's mm -hmm. like, it's pretty grating. But when you have a new album, you don't really have a choice, right? Like, what are you going to do? Just not promote your record? Not right. talk about <laughs> yeah. it? Not like you can do that. You can go, you know what? I'm, you know what? I, I don't believe in this. I feel like it's detrimental to my soul. And then yeah. your record comes out and no one listens to it. And you go, well, well you didn't do anything. Yeah, you didn't promote it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it's, I mean, listen, I get it. It's tedious. It's probably um, all-consuming. I think we're going to, 20 years from now, we're going to look back at this time and see, like, how obsessed and, and addicted and how, how much damage these things are oh, doing God, to our brain. Yeah. But who knows? Maybe 20 years from now, it's going to be in our head or it's going to be worse. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, um, we all ha we're on that brain chip implanted, so <laughs> we can control our computers that way. Yeah, it, listen, it's a. I am definitely jealous of those musicians who are successful enough where they like don't have social yeah. media. Like you see these dudes, like yeah, he doesn't have social media. I'm like, how did he do that? How? What? Yeah. Can I? Can I get that? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I just feel like it's um, it's part of the job now, and mm -hmm. so if you, it's better to embrace it, and just go full full on and go okay what tools do i have at my disposal mm -hmm. to give myself the best chance of success and if either you jump in and embrace it and treat it like another creative endeavor or you make it like a chore and then you just you don't get the most out of it you know yeah it sucks because like obviously with social media like there's no better time in history for a band to prom like no easier time for a band to promote themselves like without any other anyone involved they're able to create content <coughs> and post it and put it out there and run ads and do you know a lot of self-sufficient stuff and like there's no time like that in the past but 
also like it just sucks coming as a person in a rock band like anytime like somebody catches you slipping and posts on twitter or something like that then it becomes like a news story or you know even like the shit that i know you got involved a little bit with the whole thy art is murder drama it's like somebody kicks out their singer and all of a sudden becomes this big thing that like if you know social media was involved it wouldn't have been what it was you know but it become becomes like a you know headlines and then other people get involved and then yeah it's like you can't even like have your internal band stuff happen anymore because everything's so publicly on display like everyone lives their life on social media so for promotion wise but then they also live their life to the stuff that they don't want out there sometimes which is kind of a bummer well it's 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 so funny like i i feel like there's this weird conversation around like free speech right yeah where you have people go i can't say anything i don't free i'm for free speech but what they get mad at is other people using their free speech yeah to criticize their speech. Yeah, yeah. Right? So to me, when I see this stuff, I see a de democratized um, op opinions. Mm -hmm. Right? So you have, when everyone can chime in, you're going to get every type of opinion. Everyone's going to, and if it's something that's that's actually polarizing, you're just going to see all that. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, plus you have the element of these things are self revolving right so like you're like you do content creation you make videos and you're at the end of the day you're going to make the things that are going to do the best and get the most engagement get the most views so right. then even if you're like man this is messed up you're going to cover it <laughs> right right yeah. and yeah. then what happens then in your comments then mm -hmm. people continue the conversation and, and then it goes it gets crazier and then so everyone kind of piggybacks on on mm -hmm. top of that um and i think you know, whether you, I feel like the conversation around it is pretty broken and reactionary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's this weird thing where people like they, in their mind, they go, I hate cancel culture. I'm like, but it's kind of like saying you just hate that everyone has a voice. Yeah. Right. Like, cause, cause the only way to solve that is just go crazy thing happens and no one's allowed to say anything. Yeah. This is this is what freedom kind of looks like. Yeah. Is that it's unwieldy and you can't control the outcomes. It's like you give people these tools, you give them access, and now everyone has a voice, right? So the 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 most famous rich person and the, and the smallest small person each could like do a post that a million people, 10 million oh, people yeah. see, right? There's no uh there's no limitation to that. Mm -hmm. And that is in many ways it's like it's a dangerous thing because it's what could that could come of that right if someone yeah. is inspired to do violence because someone said something on the internet right or someone yeah. gets doxxed or someone gets fired or so on and so forth right we could think of a million different someone gets you know online harassment whatever there's all these countering things but it's like to me when people just get mad oh can i hate cancel culture i'm like you're kind of saying you just hate people yeah, because it's us. We're the mm -hmm. ones. We're all part of it. Like it's, you know, it's a, it's a very strange thing. And I, I know you weren't using that term specifically, but uh, no, no, you're you're right though. I mean, it's like people will will cry freedom of speech, but really they only want to hear the speech that they agree with. You know, if it's, it goes against their you know rhetoric or whatever, then it's like, well, that's not you know that's not what I'm talking about. Or that's I don't agree with that. Shut that down. You know, but it's like when it's it's free speech when it's like something they want to hear. It seems like. And then, you know, there's, I mean, unfortunately too, like the negativity part of it is what kind of cuts through the most. It's almost like, you know, the people who leave reviews at restaurants generally are only, it's generally the people who had a bad experience at the restaurant, the ones yeah. who will leave, leave the reviews. It's very rare that someone has a good experience. It's like, I got to tell you how much I love this restaurant. You know, it doesn't, I mean, it happens, but more, more so it's like when you have a shitty meal or like the waiter you know, barfs in your soup. You're like, I gotta fucking tell somebody about this. I gotta get my money back, you know? And it's the kind of the same thing in, in social media. Like, the the people who are the most negative tend to make the most comments a lot of times. And that's why it feels like it's so fucking toxic and negative all the time. Yeah, I mean, conflict, it's like, uh, if like you see a fight on the street, it's yeah. gonna attract a crowd. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. So we're, we're, we're infatuated with conflict, drama, um, mm -hmm beef just you know and and a lot of these uh, situations are really a manifestation of this culture war 
us versus them, this side, yeah. that side, either with me or you're against me. Yeah. Um, and, and 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 listen, that's and that's a lot of how. Uh, that's also like if you're a, a musician and you're trying to like get people on your side, mm-hmm. the point isn't to actually appeal to everyone. The point is actually really divisive and get. Yeah have a niche but then have those people be the ones who will like take a bullet for you so on the outside looking in it looks like you're you're hated but the truth is you don't need all the people like you You just need x amount of people to love you you know um and a lot of people figure that out and and the way to do that is kind of just be divisive and go Mm -hmm. i'm going to take a hard position here and even though it's going to turn off 70 percent of the normies the 30 percent that do like me are gonna be it gonna be in my pocket. So I think there's a lot of strategy, you yeah. know, to like the, so, the way some people approach this, and it's a, it's an attention economy. Like the thing you said about everyone has all this ability to reach people, and they have so much control. But the problem is there's a billion more people doing it. So yeah. there's so much competition. You have to do crazier and crazier things to get people to pay attention to you. So oh, the yeah. incentive structure is really toxic. Oh, yeah, yeah. You almost have to, like, you can't just, like, say your, you know, a statement or opinion about something. You have to go to the extreme on it because if otherwise it's going to just get, you know, mixed in with everyone else's opinion about it. And it's going to kind of get, like, lumped in. Unless, like, it's, like, it's the most extreme versions of it that really make news and make headlines and get people talking. And if that's your, and if that's your end-all goal is to get the attention, that's what people end up doing. It's weird, too. I wonder, like, how bands, like, motley crew and stuff like that would like how, what would it have been like if social media was around back then like because like, obviously they were pretty like you know public with their shenanigans and all their craziness but it's like it probably wouldn't have gone over <laughs> as well you know it, it became like lore became this like cool story but it's i mean you know there was a lot of situations where i'm sure if like someone tweeted about their experience with motley crew that could have been detrimental to the band you know at the time and i really wonder like if the band would have become or was in this day and age, you know? I, well, I think it, it's cultural, culturally yeah. dependent, right? I think there are rappers right now who live just as wild and do just as many crazy True. things as Motley Crue did 30 years ago. But yeah. the culture, rap, hip-hop culture is more accepting of, you know, it's like rappers kill someone and their sales go up. Right. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So right. the culture is is more accepting of outlandish behavior, or like if you, you know, you, you when you have all that wealth and there, you know, the whole culture is kind of wrapped up in debauchery, right? Like you have like the mm-hmm. whole emo rap phase. That whole scene, it's like they're doing pills, they're doing all the songs are about drugs. It's about you know a lot of songs about suicide and self harm and all. This. So it's like they kind of expect it, you know. Yeah. Um, I think rock and roll culture because we have decades and decades of like vh1 behind the musics and we've seen yeah. how the story ends rock stars now are just a lot more responsible and aware and you have things like uh you know like me too and things like that mm-hmm. where there's a different level of kind of accountability and awareness around groupie culture right that was like a right. big thing in the 60s and 70s and now that's probably considered not really cool anymore, right? Or at yeah, least not like, from a public right. vantage point, right? Um, like I don't think you could even be in a band and call like somebody a groupie, and and it'd be okay. I think if you called someone a groupie, people would give you shit about it, you know. Like even just saying that as to one of your fans, you know. Yeah, but guess what? You go to a big hip hop show where like there's twenty, where they're all yeah. young. That's yeah. what's going on. Oh right yeah, now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Like, <laughs> right, you know, right. but you go to a rock show, it's really not yeah. like that anymore. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there are certain bands that are doing things, but uh, it's not like, you know, I've been on a lot of big rock tours lately. It ain't like that backstage. Yeah, <laughs> it ain't it's like the of, crew it's, a, it's a lot of people, you know, drinking juice and yeah, you know, not you know, a lot of sober people. You know, it's mm-hmm. you know, because it, it's it's a business and right. people have to have longevity, especially the older bands. You know, you know, there's none of that going on because. That's the only way you can keep doing that for 20, 30 years. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, well, I, mean, but, I, I definitely see... Go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying, like, we were talking about like, James Hetfield looks great now. Like, he wouldn't look that way if he was still going hard like he was in the 80s, you know? He obviously recognized that early on. It's like, oh, I gotta get this shit together here. 
Yeah, they're all they're all like that. Um, mm-hmm. I think mainly due to the fact that the it's so rigorous their job. Yeah, you know, having you know they you know it's like most of the bands we see they'll play like an hour. They play two hours. <sighs> so crazy of some of the hardest metal. Yeah, out there, and uh, and there and it you have to be like an athlete to be able to pull that off, especially when you're when you're pushing sixty. And they, yeah. and I think they're as good now, man, as they've ever been. They're really on on top of their game, and it's but you see that and you got to go okay. That's that's the model. If you want to keep doing this, that's uh, the measuring at a high stick. level. Yeah. You have to you have to take it that seriously. Absolutely. Um, shifting gears just a little bit here. I know the new album Die By is dropping November third, and uh, I had a look at the track listing. I saw there's a song called NDA. Is it safe to assume this kind of touches on the whole Tommy Vex drama, or is that just a coincidence? I mean, I think it's just a coincidence. Yeah? Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, the, the album will be out uh, in a couple weeks, and there will be lyrics, and there will yeah. be people can kind of read read for themselves. I think it's, it's never too... Uh, you know, I don't think it's never the best thing to like tell people this is about exactly yeah. this, and this is what you should take t- take out of it. I think ultimately it's a, it's an artistic expression. Um, I didn't, I don't think I wrote, wrote any lyrics on this damn record, um, <laughs> but for the people that did, you know, uh, that was their emotional state, and that's what they felt they needed to to get across. I love the lyrics on that song. Did, have you yeah. listened to it? No, I haven't. They haven't sent me the record yet. No. Okay, we need to send you the record. Um, yeah. it's a really good song. So it's actually one of my favorite songs on the record, and yeah. actually a very different song for the band. Okay. Um, but you know, um, we're in a we're a very weird band, <laughs> where if you if you were to actually gauge all the negativity, like if you were mm-hmm. like just a bad wolves comment section, right? Yeah. It's a fucking hellscape. Right, oh, but yeah. comparative, but comparatively, like how big the band is, we probably have some of the most negativity. And by the way, from the negativity, it's not from random people. This is from our f- former fans. Yeah, you know, um, and the experience of going through that for the past couple years has taken its toll on everyone. You know, and I would imagine, yeah, when you're creating music and you're putting your your heart out there. It has to reflect your lived experience, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and if you don't like, how do you like? I think you can only just you know kind of live in silence, like suffer in silence for so long, right? You can only be stoic, just like you know, we shall overcome. They hitting you with rocks and fucking throwing, yeah. <laughs> you know, Molotov cocktails or sick and yeah. dogs on you, and you're like, we shall overcome. After, after all, you're like, you know what? I'm sick of this shit. <laughs> Then you pick up a rock and throw it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, and uh, that emotion has to go somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and each guy handles it differently. Figuring out how to deal with it publicly is like, it's like walking a tightrope. You know, what do you do if you focus too much on it? You're being negative, or you're living in the yeah. past. If you don't talk about it enough you're being avoidant and you're being boring Mm -hmm. like i did a video about like i'm gonna start talking about the stuff a little more i'm like uh, you know because if you don't talk about the elephant in the room you have nothing to talk about right it's like what what uh the album is good uh (laughs) there are songs we like them uh this song is about hope this song is about love like they talk about tommy (laughs) no but i'm just saying like yeah. That might be true, but it's just not that interesting. Yeah. And then you have, you know, it's like, trust me, in a perfect world, right? Mm. I wish we'd be like Chevelle. You know what I'm saying? I've never, I don't know what the dudes from Chevelle think. <laughs> I don't know what their political views are. Yeah, yeah. I don't know anything. They just, they just play rock music and they're right. successful. I'm like, sign me up for that. I would yeah. love to just, you know, um, but for whatever reason, it's like... You know, if if I if, if I don't if we don't put that stuff out there, I think people will be feel less engaged with with our right. story for whatever for whatever reason. You know, who knows? Who knows? Like, I feel like if you sit there and strategize too much, you kind of lose mm-hmm. the plot. You just have to kind of like use trust your instincts, be yourself, and don't let fear be the main 
thing that kind of like dictates how you're going to live. Like at, at some point you got to go, you know what? I'm sick of these people telling me what to do. I'm sick of these people telling me what mm-hmm. to do. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. I'm the one who has to live this life. I'm right. the one who has to go out here and do these interviews and play these shows and talk to the fans mm-hmm. and, and endure people. You know, it's like when you have people who literally are invested in your failure, that's a wild thing. Yeah. We play music. We're not, you know what I'm saying? We're, 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 right. we're not politicians. We're not like, we're, we're, we're Lawmakers, not like, you know, like... <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not affecting any, any people's lives in a real way. Yeah. And you have a bunch of people who like in their heart of hearts, like want to, uh, that want us to like not exist. Right. That's fucking crazy, dude. Like, and not okay, because so, you're music. They don't want you not to exist because you're music. They want you not to exist because of whatever bias they have about your past. You know. Well, That's crazy. who knows, man? I can't. I, I, yeah. I mean, like, uh, so we put out a song called "Die About It" um, mm-hmm. a few weeks ago. Put out a video, and all on one day, <laughs> you go on the YouTube. You, you can you can actually look this up. If you want to actually see what I'm talking about? There's about a hundred negative comments. Mm-hmm. On one day, yeah, all about one thing. It's not organic. They didn't just all yeah. decide. Like, you know, thing they, they were encouraged. It was a concerted to, effort. Yeah, to you know, was it was that called when you um like astroturf, mm-hmm. like like basically, and you see something like that, and you go what. Think about it. It's a hundred. A hundred people is not a lot of people, right? But on yeah. a you on a comments page, it seems like oh yeah, a lot, right? On the first just, day too. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't even the first. That's what's even crazier. It's not the first yeah. day. It was like the yeah. tenth day. It's a random uh, one day where all of a sudden a oh. hundred negative. You just get astroturfed with like all this bad stuff. But I'm just saying, like things like that. Like, what do you do with that emotionally? What do you do yeah. with that tactically? When you go, people hate us. Not yeah. everyone, but there are a contingent of people that hate you. Like, it's a yeah. very weird, it's a very strange thing. You know, it's like you look at like a Roddy Radke, right? A lot of people hate him, and he's like a bulldog, right? right. He's like, I'm coming, I'm coming head on, I'm going to tackle the haters, I'm going to, you know, yeah. but that, but he's good at it, right? He knows, like, he's always going to win because he has a million followers who mm-hmm. love him, and you can do that. But if you don't have that kind of reach and you don't have like the bully pulpit, um, it's a, it's a, it's a strange thing, but it's something like you can't run from it. You got to just accept it and go, let's, let's talk about it. Let's put it out there. Let's have the conversation, you know, yeah. plus a lot of people don't know. They don't know that that's our experience. And so it's going to show up in the artwork in in the art and, uh, we'll see because trust me, there's nothing more in the world. I'd like to move on from more, oh, I bet but I... if it's just always there, it's like, what do you do? Do we just don't either, you don't read the comments. You just stay out of that. Who knows? I don't know. I don't have it figured out. I really don't. Yeah. So when stuff like that happens, where it's like almost like a concerted effort to like bombard you or bombard a video or something like that, do you think Tommy is behind that, or do you think it's like a somebody else like that just is like has drank the Kool Aid so far that they're like they're rallying troops to do shit like that? I mean, listen, I'm not going to speculate on that. I said yeah. just use common sense and deductive reasoning. I mean, I totally think it's pretty fair. easy to figure it out. I don't think you need, like, <laughs> you know, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes or, like, you know, uh, the CIA. Yeah. You know, um, so that, but again, I don't know. I don't, I just, you know, I just, I have my own opinions about that. And I, I think people can use their own judgment to kind of think about that. I mean, if, if people care, I think at the end of the day, most people don't give a fuck. Most, like, you, we go to, a sh- we play our shows. And it, there are people there that are having fun. They're, they mm-hmm. like the band. Like, it's just this internet culture thing. And it's, I was actually thinking about this, like, uh, you know, how we're in a very strange time where you could live in, like, Iowa or some shit, right? Yeah. And then there's some war happening 10,000 miles away. Mm-hmm. And to you... It's like it might as well be happening outside your window. Right. You experience right? it firsthand. We have this way, but we have this way of localizing everything. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's kind of not really true. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like. Because you still you get to go about your day and go to Starbucks and shit. You don't have to jump on the front lines, but you feel 
Like, yeah, yeah, but people feel like, but I think it's like it creates this general anxiety where like oh, yeah. you you get people who like they'll go on Twitter or whatever and they'll just see like a video of like someone getting robbed or beat mm-hmm. down on the street, right? By the way, right. the video could be from like ten years ago, but they just saw the video. Yeah, and so now they think the world is chaos, but it's like mm-hmm. no, you're just kind of like mainlining all this stuff that like oh, yeah. like we're, our brains aren't built to like um to to ponder all the suffering of the world you know mm-hmm. we're 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 built to like deal with oh there's a fire outside i need to run yeah. from that fire there's a especially crime at a young might... age yeah i mean what i mean but guess what actually <laughs> i it, i don't think it matters what age i've seen not, you know yeah. during the pandemic i've seen people way older than me get radicalized Mm -hmm. you know it it only it doesn't take much it's just it's like internet brain um and you know i don't know it's like somehow we need to be able to go like it's over there yeah it's not really it's not that big of a deal let me kind of find a way to kind of center myself i don't know i feel like i got off topic but no no you're good no because i I mean i I read about this today. There's like uh there's like this life alert 360 thing where basically like parents can monitor their kids whereabouts like 24 7 and like i think it was like newsweek or some big publication was like surveyed a bunch of kids to find out like how do you feel about your parents like monitoring monitoring where you are 24 7 and the majority of them wanted it apparently supposedly they wanted to be kids. monitored because yeah kids wanted to be monitored because they have such general anxiety of the world around them they see so much awful things so many people getting kidnapped rapes and they see war stuff they see just terrible things constantly that they're terrified and they like the idea that you know my mom knows where i am you know if, i mean we're talking like 16 17 year olds i'm sure like a 21 year old probably doesn't want to, their mom know him but I mean, which is crazy though because when i was 15 or 16 i i would have just thrown my phone out the window rather than have my mom monitor where i was you know so Dude, it's crazy eight that, like, years old we used to leave the house at 10 in the morning and not mm-hmm. come back till it was night oh yeah <laughs> dude, we were the street lights yeah wild shit do you know what i'm saying we were <laughs> We were shoplifting. Oh, yeah. We was wa- looking at porn in the woods. <laughs> we, we were doing vandalism. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's not all we did, but <laughs> at some, you know, we were having fun and doing normal kids, riding yeah. bikes and doing normal kid stuff, but we were also, like, up to no good <laughs> yeah. as well. And, like, you know, but there was no, you know, it's it. what we, you, you have is, like, a um, kind of contradictive pattern, right? Where, like... Mm-hmm. If you look at all the data, uh, the world kind of keeps getting safer. Crime yeah. generally, the, all the the, uh, the trends are down. You know, right? I mean, I mean, over long periods of time, yeah, yeah. A slight uptick in 2020, where a lot of crime and violent crime went up, but the, the overall trend is down. But the more safety people have, the less safe they feel because mm-hmm. they just have more access to all this stuff. You know, like I said if someone yeah. If some kid gets kidnapped halfway across the country, why should that make you 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 feel like your kids are less safe? That's kind of nothing to do with you, and and we're yeah we're I you know who knows how it's going to end up, but I think it's this you, you kind of bring up this idea that like um, all these things that are seen as as uh, dystopian or like Orwellian, mm-hmm. like Big Brother, all stuff is a lot of this stuff we're gonna do to ourselves or we're gonna yeah. want. We're, you know, we're, it's not like a top-down thing where I'm sure that happens. You know, with like uh, the UK and CCTV or like the, the the Chinese government's like surveillance state, and yes, that's top-down. But a lot of stuff is also going to come from us. Where like generations ago, the uh, privacy was a really, really important thing for for people, and now we're less. We don't. It's not as much of a value. Mm-hmm. people they're used to being more transparent and having like and be you know it's like people just they live stream themselves all day right, right they're, yeah people they're letting be. people in they're yeah. you know like their every thought their every thing they think they just put out there oh yeah <laughs> you know, yeah like, so like, you can't just have a thought and not vocalize it anymore it seems like you have to <laughs> every opinion has to be yeah. put out there damn yeah, yeah so, it's, it's, so it's, it's it's this weird thing you know 
it's a big generational shift for sure. And like, like you said, like, I mean, my God, if my mom was able to watch what I was doing 24 seven, like, and be able to find me, find me sneaking behind, uh, the corner store to drink some liquor or something like, holy shit. <laughs> like, we're rather, again, we're rather throwing my phone out the window than, than have that happen. But yeah, I mean, I didn't have to grow up watching constant awfulness in my feed on my, on my phone every single day. Cause I didn't have, I didn't even have a cell phone when I was eight or nine. So yeah, I mean, dude, I remember, I mean, think about this, like, Rodney King, you know, got mm-hmm. beat up, it was in 1992 or something like that, I forget the exact like year, um, and that was like, people were shocked, right? Oh, so yeah. shocking. Now I just see people just straight up getting murdered. Yeah. <laughs> like, multiple dude. times. It, like, yo, when people yeah. will send me, will like, tag right. me and things, I'm like, mm-hmm. why are you sending me murder videos? Mm-hmm. Like, th- think about how desensitized we are. Like, right. that's, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. I remember, like, the craziest video that existed on the internet was two girls eating poop out of a cup in, like, fucking 20... Is that what that... That'd be, I never watched that video. <laughs> oh, I never watched it, but I got the cliff notes, you know? That's I, what I it mean, is. Okay. Yeah, I got the... Glad know, I missed that. <laughs> yeah. Once I got the general idea, I'm like, I'm good. I don't think I, I need to see it. But, like, that sounds so juvenile compared to some of the crazy shit that just you can watch on YouTube anymore. Like, it's crazy. Yeah, like, I don't yeah. want to see the next level up from that. No. I'm good. Yeah. You know, people, it's should... like, there's, there's that crazy horror movie, a Serbian film. Have you heard about this? Oh, I've heard of it. I've never watched it, though. I never got yeah, into I'm it. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. When people tell you how crazy it is, I'm like, no, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. I watched The Human Centipede, and even that was too much for me, man. I was like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> like, it just That movie, did you see Human Centipede? Yeah. Oh, dude, that just made me feel weird for days. Like, I couldn't even, like, yeah. shake it. Like, <laughs> I just felt, like, off. Anyone listening, but, don't watch Human Centipede. Don't do it. <laughs> there is something funny about it, though. There's... Oh, yeah, it's hilarious. Yeah, it's, <laughs> like, the concepts and everything. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, oh, man. Um, one one quick thing I want to get to. I had Ben Bruce from Asking Alexandra on the podcast. He was actually the first guest I had in the uh, podcast, and um, we got into discussion about new metal. And he said new metal was the greatest era of metal, and that went crazy headlines everywhere because you know obviously everyone has a feeling about new metal. And then I think it was Paulo from Trivium commented and said that new metal was the worst genre. It was top to bottom a terrible genre and you got involved and defended you came to the defense of new metal which i love to see so that leads me to my question i gotta know what do you think is the greatest new metal song of all time what's the definitive track that comes to mind when you think of new metal i mean the most definitive metal you know new metal track is blind by corn that's the one that encapsulates it that's the one that started it that's the one that you know has pretty much all the elements you know we can look at stuff you know, like even, you know, like, like Linkin Park to me was almost much more rock and mm-hmm. much more like pop, like they had pop elements that, yes, it's in the overall thing, but it's the, the purity of, of that. You can, you know, like down with the sickness, you can kind of say maybe yeah. it's a song like that or, you know, even like Chop Suey, I feel like, isn't, is it really new metal? Like that could almost come out yeah. any time. Like it's right. But to me, the, you know, Corn Blind is, 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 is number one, but it's a, it's a really interesting conversation because it's just completely generational right like i think both those guys are making very um subjective statements it's like the thing i grew up on is the best (laughs) (laughs) it's like yes because you have uh an emotional attachment to to the stuff that um you know moved you when you were when you were young and we are you know music is so is autobiographical Mm -hmm. that's how we contextualize it that's how there's an emotional core to it. When you listen to something and really absorb it from that, like 12 to like 21 age. Oh yeah. That's prime. nothing because of who you are and you're developing, mm. it's going to have a different impact on you. And so mm. it's, there's, there's kind of no way around that. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm just sounds no, like over here. Um, and I love it all. Like I, I'm, I'm at my heart of hearts. I'm like a old school, like thrash, Dude, you know, all the, you know, the yeah. big four, Sepultura, Creator, Testament, you know, and even like, you know, but all the stuff from the mid 90s, Pantera and White Zombie and um, and all the grunge shit that came around that time was like, all yeah. that stuff is like embedded on, on me. Um, 
but I think every time there's something cool that was new, I was always trying to like get into it and vibe on it, you know. Mm-hmm. And the thing I loved about the new metal thing was like it's something different. It's like they're oh, bringing yeah. different elements. It's like who wants to just like the, if it's you know some of those bands are coming out in the mid '90s or late '90s, and it's you know it, those thrash bands were doing different things as well, but like. Would it just have been cool if just, like, we were just doing the same things? Like, if there were bands in the 90s, right. I'm just going to redo Metallica. I'm just going to redo Pantera. It's yeah. like, no, they were taking it in different lanes. Um, and they, like, look, look at a band like Slipknot, who came out, like, basically, like, to me, when I heard Slipknot, I was like, oh, it's it's just sped up corn with double bass, right? <laughs> right? But then they went and they started you know they started playing with bands like god forbid and kill switch and lamb of god and their music got more metal and more traditional kind yeah. of as the band went on they started adding guitar solos and they started and it kind of like combined all of that and then you go well is corn is slip not even a new metal band anymore mm-hmm. are are they they're just a metal band right they're just like they're kind of like so, so the genres almost become less important. And then you look at a band like Asking Alexander, I think is interesting where, dude, I remember when they first came out, I was like, oh, I'm like, this is crazy. Like if you just waited long enough and you like, basically you just look like a scene band, you can have new metal riffs and people are thinking yeah. it's cool. Like when we came up, it like was not cool to, if like there was like, there was real metal. If you're yeah. new metal, you were like a sellout poser, <laughs> you know, like it was, you couldn't, sound like that or else you weren't it, it wasn't cool it wasn't real it wasn't yeah you know and and then oh it, yeah and it completely flipped because enough time had passed where you know i'm 42 so if you were to take someone who's like maybe five even five years younger than me or seven years younger than me their first bands they were discovering were slipknot and disturbed in oh like yeah park and that's just enough where like that's for them, that's their Metallica, and that's going to mm-hmm. be that's what shaped the way they see uh, what metal is. And there's and there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the same way, like Black Sabbath and Iron Maiden didn't shape me, but I can appreciate it, and I can go back and and absorb it and love it, and you know. And it's all about kind of like I think the whole like this is the best or it's like, well, it's, <laughs> what? It, just, you like it. Why does it have to be the best? It's not a competition. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think that that's a good point too. Why so many modern bands sound like Lincoln park because they came up during like that whole era when Lincoln park was one of the biggest rock bands in the world. I also love how like, um, like we retrospectively put box these bands into certain genres, you know, like, like for me, like I never considered Slipknot a new metal band, and then now looking back, you know, they, they definitely get when the subject of new metal is brought up, they're, you know, considered a new metal. And even like a band like Papa Roach, who I would consider a new metal band, a lot of people consider them an emo band. They'll, they'll lump them in with the whole emo movement sometimes just because like the, the subject matter, I guess, you know, but, or whatever, like the, or the timing that it comes out. It's just funny because like at the time when you're living in it, it's just music to you. It's just like, it's rock music. It's, you, you know, you kind of identify with the genres a little bit, but you're just mostly identifying with the songs. And then retrospectively, you go back and be like, okay, this band's in this box, this band's in that box. <laughs> you know, it's kind of funny how we like do that when, uh, after it's all said and done. Yeah. I mean, to me, the biggest bands defy the genres, right? Yeah. Or they're like, they appeal to everyone. And you, like, right. before you mentioned Papa Roach, like, sometimes it's about, the scene you're in, right? And the mm-hmm. aesthetic, right? So it's like how the band looks, you know, yeah. like like a band like Bring Me the Horizon came out and was deathcore, but right. emo kids liked them because they looked like an emo band. Yeah. Right? Like Black Dahlia Murder was a, you know, melodic death metal band, but they looked like a hardcore band so they could play with terror. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so much of yeah, it is scene and aesthetic and how you carry yourself. Um, yeah. And then, but when you take a band like you, like Pop Roach, right? So if you actually look to analyze their sound, they basically are a post-hardcore band with okay. punk influence. Yeah, I could hear with that. With the guy who was singing and rapping. Mm-hmm. So what is a signifier of new metal? Rapping. Right. And also groove. Right? Yeah. But they also had this thing that it was like, they had that rock radio thing, right? Mm-hmm. That like... You look at what they did, and then see the bands that like bands like uh, 
trapped, right? They had a song yeah. that, like, oh, that could be, or like Hoobastank or yeah. Trust Company, or like these bands were, but that was, a, you know, they were like at the forefront of that sound. So it's like they combined all these things. And then when New Metal is kind of taking a, no, a nosedive, He's like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of take a beat on this rapping and kind of yeah. get a little more into this kind of warp tour sound. And they started doing mm. those tours and and they evolved, you know, and they kind of yeah. moved in. Started and that's why they have, <laughs> yeah, but they have significance yeah. in that world because it was part of their sound and they yeah. evolved. They were like, we're not just gonna do this one thing or be in this one world. We're gonna keep moving with the times, and it, and it's not fake. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very genuine. It's like what they were feeling and it worked. And now years later, they've combined it all, right? It mm -hmm. all makes sense. And there's a big kaleidoscope of, of sounds and cultures. And the biggest bands are like that. You'll see Metallica. It's like, it's rock people. It's metal people. It's punk people. It's everything. It's normies. You go, you know, we, we are yeah. with Volbeat. Volbeat, it's like... Who, what kind like i'm out there I'm like i don't even know what genre this is it's yeah, like right rockabilly and it's yeah you know sounds like social distortion and this song sounds like a slayer song and this song, like it's a it's bringing a wide variety of, of different people and i think the biggest bands are the ones that get all these different scenes together and they're not really mm -hmm. one genre but i think the genres make it easy to like go okay it's it's, it's it's for the media. It's good to like mm -hmm. lump everything in one one thing, but it's also like as a a fan. Sometimes you go like I'm like one thing I kind of that's I think funny now is like when I came up, there was no metalcore scene, and now yeah. there's like a culture that's like we are into metalcore. Yeah, this yeah. is how we dress. These are our this is our scene. This is what it is, and it's like that's a, almost a self signifier, right? It's like this mm -hmm. is my tribe. This is who, who who I am. This is our our thing over here. So it's I think for for that it's important. But the biggest it's yeah. like Bring Me the Horizon. Are they metalcore? They do everything. Right. They have pop songs and they have you know metal songs and they have they and they they do everything you know. And and you go to that show and I bet you it's all people from all walks of life coming to a show like that. Yeah, I feel like they just like started taking screamo music and calling it metalcore one day. It's what it feels like a lot. Of, like like a lot of uh, people call like Under Oath like metalcore or something. Like wait a minute, like when I was a kid they were a screamo band. Now they're a metalcore band. <laughs> like it's just funny how like it basically kind of just. Evolved. I mean, I mean, obviously it's a little bit different than what it was sounding like back then, but it does sound like they kind of just took that title away from them and started calling them that now. Yeah, but it was all, but it was always interchangeable, right? I remember yeah, there was an mm -hmm. article. I want to say it was rolling stone or something like that and it was like the dawn of screamo and it was uh thrice poison the well mm -hmm. and thursday was in the article and like could you i think you i think you would have called poison the well metalcore You're right yeah back then you know i think i think thrice flirted with metalcore right they yeah. had songs that were metalcore songs mm -hmm. um and then Thursday was like to me like a classic emo band, but they called yeah. screamo because they was their screw. So it's like, right? What does, do you know what I'm saying? But the truth yeah, yeah, is, yeah. if you're a band that could be considered both things, you get to exist in both worlds. Oh yeah, always, absolutely. And if you can do that, you always tend to benefit. Mm-hmm. Because so. because you get people from both both worlds, and that's I think that's the best when you have almost like people fighting over you. Like, yeah. no, they're this. No, they're that. Like, think about it being like the Deftones. Like, they exist right. in so many different lanes, and that mm -hmm. it just helps their success. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, like, I, I think, like, once you have enough people, like, one of, like, when you have people, like, fighting over like, what genre you are, I think, I think that's a good sign that you're popular because if enough people care about what genre you are, Absolutely. that means a lot of people care about who you are just to begin with. So. Or you could but. be the worst where you, like, you fit with no one and no one yeah. claims you. <laughs> Yeah, but the best is like when fans. yeah the best is when a band like is clearly fits in a genre and they don't want to and they're like like no we are not new metal goddamn <laughs> and they like fight it you know yeah like, but pretty much every new metal enough, band I think hated it yeah but every genre like that where it's like a dirty word if you just yeah. wait ten years then it becomes cool oh that's cool so <laughs> yeah wait wait ten twenty years and then they're gonna have a giant festival for it in Las Vegas and then you'll get to cash in. <laughs> Well, Doc, dude, it's been so awesome talking to you, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. And everyone watching and listening, please 
go buy or stream the crap, whatever you do for music for Die About It when it comes out on November 3rd. We need to get these this music heard everywhere because and i'm excited to hear the full record in full Thank uh you. hopefully hopefully i can get the uh the leak early and get to get to hear it um but uh so everyone follow doc on instagram and are, any, are you anywhere else on the socials instagram tiktok uh twitter threads all this it's all my name doc coil at doc coil twitch at all everything's my name hell yeah not that exciting i need a cool like handle no, dude, your name's already cool. You don't need <laughs> at, at Jughead dot com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got a badass name. You're like, no, nah, I gotta fuck. I need something better. <laughs> well, no, but you see, like, like I was, I was looking at the Tim Henson from uh, Polyphia. Yeah. It's like worst with the six. I'm like, that's cool. Oh, uh, uh, that, that is pretty like, cool. It's like a secret agent name, you know? <laughs> Thunderfoot. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Axe Man. I need. I need. Anyway. There you go. It's fine. No, I, we'll, we'll workshop it, man. We'll figure it out. Until then, <laughs> though, get him at Doc Coyle on all the socials. And I'm Jesse Lee everywhere as well. Make sure to uh, do all the button mashing below, the likes, the subscribes, comment. You know, don't leave 100 mean comments in a row like some people do. But, uh, you know, maybe just uh, a few nice ones would be cool. I think no, be great. See, see, you got 100% approval. Everyone likes you. You're so nice oh, and God. endearing. Okay. I, I, I don't know, I'm man. Glad. <laughs> By the way, have you ever have you ever met uh, Josh Gilbert from Azalea Dying? So I have not met him, but I've been told that I look a lot like him on many occasions. <laughs> at birth, all right. You guys need to get together and just to, just for the picture, just for the for, Dude, the, for the likes, all right. So I followed him on Instagram after some like enough people mentioned that in my comment section, and then I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I fucking see it. Like we're both bald dudes with beards for sure. Like and definitely, there's a lot of facial features, but yeah. But so now. I follow him. I'm always commenting on his shit and like messaging him. I'm like, I'm like, now I feel like I'm a fanboy just because he looks like me. You know, I mean, I like his bands, but yeah. <laughs> well, came, but like, that, you're just saying that is narcissistic. You're just saying you like yeah. yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, was a weird, it was a weird gateway into Josh <laughs> Gilbert. <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> but it's good stuff. All right, man. It was great chatting with you and everyone else. Take it easy now. And uh, bye bye.